Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my lecture. The animal that therefore I am. Thank you for your attendance. It's an honor to speak to you all today. I also want to thank both the School of the Art Institute of Cats and the Art Institute of Cats for hosting this event. My name is Logos, and I lived with the philosopher Jacques Derrida in 1997. Dorita delivered an address that would become The Animal That Therefore I Am A philosophical work about the non-humanist subject This work was inspired by an encounter Dorita and I had One morning when I followed him into the bathroom He disrobed in order to shower When he noticed me and we made eye contact Dorita was struck by his own nakedness before me And for the first time considered himself through the eyes of an animal. This thought drives Dorita down an existential rabbit hole, where he considers the blurred line between humanity and animality. However, while he does critique ontologies that impoverish the animal, Dorita fails to imagine a world conceived by animals, or as Donna Haraway asserts, to seriously consider an alternative form of knowing something more about cats, and how to look back, perhaps even scientifically, biologically, and therefore, also philosophically and intimately. Dorita writes, Before the cat that looks at me naked, would I be ashamed like a beast that no longer has the sense of its nudity? Or, on the contrary, like a man who retains the sense of his nudity? Who am I? Therefore, whom should this be asked of, if not of the other, and perhaps, of the cat itself? The following slide lecture, is an account of my response to Dorita in my own thinking after our encounter. In the beginning, I would like to entrust myself to words that, were it possible, would be naked, as I made eye contact with the naked and ashamed philosopher. It struck me that the human body is not just the lens through which the human sees. It is a form that constructs sight, human sight, and thus aesthetics and ethics are products of human bodies. Kenneth Clark describes the human body as a lifelong companion with scale and rhythm that shape aesthetic sensibilities. Clark explains that our continuous effort made in defiance of the pull of gravity to keep ourselves balanced upright on our legs affects every judgment on design. The rhythm of our breathing and the beat of our hearts are part of the experience by which we measure a work of art. The relation of head to body determines the standard by which we assess all other proportions in nature. This embodied proportionality incarnates a viewer, rendering him tangible and measurable. Donald Preziosi argues, 4. If man were the measure of all things, James Burke reasons, then all things must surely relate to the measure of man, his experiences, his observations, his points of view. Albrecht Durer famously explained that perspective is a Latin word which means seeing through. In his treatise on perspective, Erwin Panofsky contextualizes this quote in terms of the picture plane as a window to an illusionary world. But in another sense, perspective is to see through the eyes of a body, first demonstrated by Bruno Lasky and then systematized by Alberti in 1435. Linear perspective represented a seismic shift in aesthetic paradigm. As John Berger explains, perspective makes the single eye the center of the visible world, establishing what Victor Bergen calls monocular perspective as the primary observer. The verisimilitude produced by linear perspective was intrinsic to an emergent Western project. W.J.T. Mitchell explains that perspective was aided by the political and economic ascendance of Western Europe, conquering the world of representation under the banner of reason, science, and objectivity. However, as Preziosi observes, this project was in reality an ideological fabrication, a powerful format of representation that placed the individual at the center of structures, making this subject the place where ideological meanings were revealed. Bergen contends that this foregrounding of an individualist construction of meaning materializes amidst the mercantile capitalism of the Renaissance, cultivating what he calls an ocular subject. 
free to pursue its entrepreneurial ambitions. Wherever trade winds blow. The ocular subject centers anatomical agency as an expression of economic agency. The ocular subject's identity derives then from the human skeletal oculus as bipedal, mammalian, primates with frontal skull orbits. Humans possess binocular or stereoscopic vision, which allows for a depth perception necessary to track and pursue prey, perhaps the predatory anatomy of human vision is part of the economic and aesthetic relationship between capitalism and linear perspective. The nature of this predatory vision might best be understood in terms of the symbolic gesture that is perception. If sight is a projection of self, a filtering of the world through the biology of the viewer, then as Ian Bogost observes, Anthropocentrism is unavoidable, at least for humans. This anthropocentrism takes the form of what Bogost calls metaphorism, or the way something understands something else. By analogy, reaching for it, metaphorically, the metaphor produces an unavoidable distortion of the subject. What Graham Harmon calls caricature, the illusion of perspective, is the conflation of the anthropocentric caricature with representational symbolism. Symbolism is a form of violence. Giovanni Allo asserts, a representational violence against plants and animals. It's a form of muting. It's a form of subjugation. These are some of the contexts in which naked Dorito looked at me. But what of how I looked at him? The relation of head to body, bipedality, height, and binocularity shape human aesthetics. Then, what makes the phenomenological experience of Phallus Catus unique? How do the features of cat embodiment shape our perspective? Cats are quadrupedal mammals with an average height of 9 to 10 inches and average length of 18 inches. While cats feel the vision is wider than humans, cats can't see distant objects with as much clarity. The human visible color spectrum, which falls between ultraviolet and red light, is estimated to be able to distinguish up to 10 million colors. Cats have a much smaller and less intense visible color spectrum. We have only two color detecting clones that allow us to see yellow green and blue-violet wavelengths. The reflective quality of cat eyes derives from the taped and lucidum at the back of our eyes, a layer of tissue that reflects light back into the retina to increase scotopic or low-light vision. With this body in mind, what can be said of a cat aesthetics? Without a feline art history, I begin to answer this question through a feline analysis of human representations of cats. In ancient Egypt, cats were first domesticated during the Middle Kingdom. The advent of agriculture attracted rodents, 
who attracted wild cats, who became useful for pest control. By the New Kingdom, cats were common in households, and regarded as important supernatural figures. Cats were treated well, and their remains were mummified when they died. This sarcophagus statuette, is an accurate depiction of the size and proportions of a cat. Though the subtle stylization and religious significance of cats in Egyptian culture centered the value of cats to human civilization more than anything else, the ancient Nazca people of Peru created large drawings carved into the land. This simple line drawing of a cat is enormous and dwarfs both cats and humans, but expands the cat to a size that reverses the size differential between humans and cats. The Egyptian piece is a more accurate depiction of cat's eyes, but the Nazca piece allows human viewers to feel what a cat's perspective is like when confronted with a human body. By contrast, this Persian miniature painting, found in the St. Petersburg Muraka, depicts a point of view looking down at the cat. From the height of a human, the domestication of the cat is fundamental to the piece, as the background animals appear wild and free, while the cat in the foreground is leashed to a stake in the ground. Mughal brushes, like the ones likely used here, were made from kitten hairs. So the work features the subjugation of cats to anthropocentric process and imagery. In both of these paintings, cats drink milk, but the title of the Marguerite Gerard painting, The Cat's Lunch, or young girl giving milk to her cat, bears some consideration. In one version, the title centers the narrative on the cat's experience, while the other title centers the narrative on the human. Although the cat has been elevated above the dog, it is still visually lower than the girl. In Napoleonic France, cats were associated with women and children. The kneeling height of the girl along with a similar palette as the cat creates a visual association between the two. Also noteworthy is the lunch being served to the cat because adult cats are lactose intolerant. In both this ancient Roman mosaic and Picasso's cat devouring bird, the viewer is placed at eye level with a cat biting at a dead bird. However, in both images, the cat looks up towards the foreground, as though it is being interrupted by a human viewer. Note the cat's arched back and raised fur, indicating a defensive posture as it encounters the human gaze. Picasso's cat is rendered with a typical post-cubist deformation. Modernist representation crystallized during 19th century industrialization producing increasingly alienated and fragmented aesthetics. Cubism fractured Renaissance perspective and reconfigured it as disoriented and volatile forms, revealing an extractive process of objectification. While each work explores narratives driven by the cat's desires and autonomous actions, they are both more about the disruption of animal life by humans and the distortion through representation. In Hiroshige's woodblock print, a cat sits in the midground of the pleasure quarters of a brothel, looking out over the Asakusa rice fields at a procession celebrating the Toronomishi festival. However, a real cat would have difficulty seeing the field or procession from that distance. Although the cat is focal, the composition's verticality and point of view behind the cat evoke the human perspective of the prostitute, who also occupies the room. Similarly, in Manet's Olympia, the black cat on the right of the composition represents prostitution and stands on the bed where the woman lays. Like Dorita, the reclined figure is nude in a room with a cat, but they do not make eye contact. Instead, both the reclined woman and the cat face the viewer. The maid is given almost equal compositional weight to the reclined figure, though her gaze is on the courtesan, rather than empowered with a confrontational stare at the viewer. For both women, non-human life is used as a prop for characterization. 
The cat represents alert sexualized femininity. And the flowers, gifted from an admirer, indicate both the status of the maid as a servant and male sexual desire. In both cases, non-human life is subordinated to the supplementary. In Kassad's children playing with a cat, the cat is once again associated with women and children. The child on the left plays at being like the adult woman on the right, holding a cat like the woman holds a baby. Both the cat and the baby are naked, and the baby reaches for the cat, furthering their association. While all of the humans look at something, the cat has its eyes closed, indicating a diminutive subjectivity below that of a human infant. Like Gerard's painting, a young girl tends to a cat, in this case, explicitly as a kind of training for motherhood, as part of a gendered domestic hierarchy. Mark Dion Scala Natura also explores status as he constructs a form inspired by Aristotle's metaphysical classifications. Dion positions discarded industrial objects at the lowest step, followed by organic objects, ascending in complexity. With each subsequent step, a taxidermy cat and bird sit below the top tier, which is occupied by a bust of Aristotle. Humans are represented at both the top and bottom of the hierarchy. As Dion presents a critique of Western philosophical ontologies. However, the postmodern milieu in which Dion works presents a critique of knowledge systems. While using those same systems of knowledge, postmodernism developed in conjunction with the rise of neoliberal capitalism, an era defined by radical financialization of economies. In this context, the dominant aesthetic was detached from material dialectics, as neoliberalism itself is a system of aesthetic abstraction. It is an invisible dead-driven power structure, obscured by vertiginous global bureaucracy, and protected by state violence. The aesthetic of neoliberalism is one of debt, of the endless representation of speculative wealth. Value may not be accumulated. It merely retroactively supports the architecture of the present condition, through the endless cycle of finance. Imagery and ideas may be reshuffled, but not destroyed or generated. The fictionality of the postmodern society elides its material conditions. Futurity and alternativity are not possible constructions in postmodernity, which is all closed loops, spectacle, and simulacra. Thus far, I have analyzed human art and the qualities and limitations of its visual and political constructions from a post-human lens. But what can we say of an alternative? What is the embodied vision of cats? What is the feline aesthetics? Perhaps this would incorporate limited palettes and levels of light so low that humans would not be able to see them. Maybe, instead of the predominance of the line or brush stroke, in human art, to produce marks and gestures of permanence, the cat aesthetic would be defined by ephemeral paw prints, or non-visual elements like scents, tastes, and pheromones. Perhaps, feline art exists in cat's alpha brainwaves, where psychic phenomena have been linked. These are the aesthetic contexts, in which I perceived Jacques Derrida, the day our eyes met, while he was naked and staring at me, the animal, that therefore, I am.